Gracias por invitarme a estar aquí con ustedes en esta la hermosa ciudad de Barcelona. In September 2012, I went on a spiritual journey on a very physical road, probably familiar to many of you. The Camino de Santiago is an ancient pilgrim road, actually many roads that converge in the city of Santiago de Compostela in western Spain. It starts, the traditional way starts, in a village, a French village of Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port and continues westward 800 kilometers across northern Spain. I went on the journey because I needed some time to reflect on personal and professional life. Along the way, I met many strangers, one of whom was Michael. He became a close friend, and we walked together periodically throughout the journey for uh, several days. Michael was an Irish priest. He was a very memorable looking character, silver haired, he wore bicycle kit, these very ridiculous colored clothes even though we were walking, and he had that wonderful gift for telling stories and making other people laugh. One of the things that we began to contemplate as we walked together was how the Camino was a metaphor for life. And it got me thinking, what could the Camino teach us about leadership as a metaphor? So that's what I'm here to talk with you about today. Four capacities that I believe are essential to leadership today. And they are the capacity for the tolerance for ambiguity, discernment, resilience, and self-awareness. Now, I've been a leadership consultant for 30 years and an executive coach for 15, and I've witnessed what I believe is an evolution in how we understand leadership and the complexities of that role. Not that long ago, leadership was understood to be someone who could inspire others through a shared vision, through collaboration and support, build empowerment, someone who would challenge the status quo and innovate by looking for opportunities, somebody who would reward and recognize other people, and who modeled clear values. These were well-established, they were well-researched, and it was not easy, but it seemed like it was a fairly straightforward and well-understood description and formula, really, for what leadership was all about. These traditional leadership competencies were developed with industrial age expectations and understandings of what local economies and structured organizations and fewer relationships uh, had to do with business. But that's not the world that we live in today. What we experience in today's business environment is a pace of change that we call a VUCA world. This is the language that was introduced in the US in the, um, in the armed forces to describe an environment of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Many companies today are both global and local and need to integrate strategies and tactics on both levels in order to compete. Productivity problems do not have a single source. And the uh, issues that we may see in one part of the business can cause a rapid disruption in other parts of the business, sometimes with disproportionately large consequences. Best practices do not apply in an era of mass customization, and overly simplified responses are just that. Those essential leadership practices of vision, empowerment, innovation, and leading by example are important to be sure, but they are the price of entry for organizational leadership. To tackle this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment, this VUCA world, we need something more than a clear vision, something more than spreadsheets 
and project plans or even great communication skills. What we need to help leaders build are higher level capacities that will allow them to succeed in this evolving world. A synthesis of skills and competencies that can apply to a wide variety of circumstances. These are rare and they're valuable. They allow people to uh, respond to in situations that they have not seen before and, uh, and are transferable across many scenarios, much more than any specific knowledge or skill set for a particular problem. So let's start with the first of these capacities, the tolerance for ambiguity. Tolerancia para la ambiguidad. When I was on the Camino, I acquired a habit of rising very early every morning, and I would start out in the dark, getting my, my uh, pack together very early. Sometimes it was very difficult to find La Flecha or La Venera to find the way, but one morning I was out walking uh, in the dark out in the countryside for about one or two kilometers, and I saw up ahead of me the lamps of several other pilgrims, only they were very confusing because the path was going one way, but the lamps were kind of moving off into the fields, it seemed like, and as I got closer, I saw there was a huge fence that extended far into the darkness on each side, and the path went right up to the fence. And there were seven or eight pilgrims, very agitated, very concerned. They would walk a little way down one path, and then they'd walk a little way down the other, but there was no arrow, and there was no shell to mark the way. And our guidebooks did not tell us which way to go. What was most remarkable about this scene was the level of agitation and almost panic, as if it was impossible for them to consider just taking a direction and seeing what would happen. So I observed this for a little while and then started off down the road. Excuse me. To my surprise, when I looked back, they were all following me like a bunch of ducklings. And off we went, and very soon the road turned around the fence, and there was the arrow, and off we went. Simply put, sometimes you need to just act without knowing if it will work out. Our global and dynamic organizations generate wildly differing points of view and not a lot of clarity. Tolerance for ambiguity has become one of the most cited leadership competencies for executives in today's world. It's the ability to take action without really knowing if this is the right thing to do, or without knowing if your past experience is going to be any guide for the future. For some people, it's the ability to take no action, to maintain a non-anxious presence long enough to see what will emerge and stay in that state of not knowing. Capacity to tolerate ambiguity depends heavily on another one of these, uh, one, another one of these uh, capacities that I believe are, are important. And this is the capacity for discernment. We are in a world where we are absolutely saturated with information that we're expected to absorb and respond to often instantly. Discernment is the ability of being able to see or understand that which is hidden or obscure and to correctly perceive the right course of action. In our business worlds, it's the ability to take the right strategic action at the right time, the ability to know when and how to turn up the heat and create urgency, or how to turn it down in order to allow people to rest and recover. It's the ability to be politically savvy, the ability to see the big picture and the small details, and know which of these small details are important. In essence, it means having keen insight and good judgment. At the very start of my journey in St. John Pierre de Port, I went to the Oficina del Peregrino to register as a pilgrim and receive my credencial that would allow me to stay in the hostels as a pilgrim. 
The Portuguese volunteer collected my demographic information, and when she was finished, she reached across the table and grabbed my hands and looked me straight in the eye, and she said, this is your Camino. Do this any way you want. That message stuck with me, stood with me uh, over the course of several weeks, particularly when I was having to make a choice about what to do. Should I stay in a particular place or not? Should I walk with a person or not? Uh, should I rest? Should I go on? These seemingly simple decisions had profound implications on my health or my spirit. I was able to shut out the distractions of other people's agendas, of the weather, and the road itself in order to remain true to what my purpose was in being there at the Camino. In our business worlds, we are barraged with priorities and agendas and ideas and relationships and details. Having an anchor, being clear about what really matters, what's really important to us, is it gives us a line of sight about what's essential and helps make those decisions when there is a lot of doubt. This is the capacity for discernment. Another one of the VUCA capacities is resilience. Resilience is a capacity to recover one's balance and remain optimistic even in the face of grave disappointment or loss. It's a determination, a hardiness, a stick to for the journey. On the Camino, at the risk of stretching a metaphor, it took a while for me to develop the stamina to keep walking. The first few days were exciting. I was in a foreign country, was enjoying all that Spain had to offer, meeting people from all over the world, many of whom were out there on their own spiritual journey. But after a while, I became tired. I lost touch with the friends that I had made. I got lost, literally. After a time, I hurt physically. I developed pains in my knees and my legs that I'd never had before. I walked myself into a huge blister on the bottom of my foot that required me to stop and seek medical attention. Yet amazingly, my body would heal overnight, enough to get started again the next day, and gradually, this became a habit, and I learned to keep walking. Resilience is not simply determination, though that's part of it. Resilience has at its heart a sense of hope, the ability to convey genuine faith and optimism and conviction that the journey itself matters and that it will lead to a better future. That's what propels, that provides the fuel for yourself and for others, others to keep going, even when they're tired and sore and disappointed. The last capacity I'll talk about here is perhaps the most critical in that it, it's the catalyst that I believe makes the others grow, and that's the capacity for self-awareness. However much I may learn about business and about other people, it is my own self that is the hardest to learn about. In the research that talks about how or why leaders derail or why they fail, self-awareness is the number one reason that gets cited. And I'm not talking about that underlying fundamental leadership practice of being able to be clear about what you stand for and what your values are and what matters to you. That's important, it's essential. What I'm talking about are, is the ability to know what my strengths are and what my flaws are and have received information about that enough so that I can manage those things. Without self-awareness, we don't learn what we need to learn. A common experience that people have on the Camino is sharing intimate details with your personal, with, about your personal life with people that you've just barely met. Uh, I shared a lot about my life with Michael and he with me. One of the things that he told me after getting to know me a little bit was some very startling feedback. It was, this was my lemon. He said, you are, you are too self-sufficient. You are too fast to go after what you want. 
He said, you don't think anybody else can do it as well as you can. You don't let anybody help you. He said, you have to let other people lead if you're going to have a partnership. Well, that was not my image of myself at all. That was a shock to me to see myself as too independent and too impatient. In our VUCA worlds, it is critical to convene open and transparent conversations about the challenges that we face. We have to be able to see the value in varying perspectives because we have to rely on one another to solve these complex challenges that we have. That means that sometimes we're going to get information that is different about the world than how we think it ought to be, or certainly is different about ourselves than what, who we think we are. It's a remarkable thing to walk day after day with an intention to reflect about those things that are important to you, and then every day to fulfill that intention. Walking the Camino, it is easy to sustain deliberation for long hours at a time. Oh, I forgot to show you self-awareness. <laughs> Inevitably, that much reflection results in a shifting of perspectives, a broadening and deepening of the lens that we use to look at what's important to us. This is a critical factor in development, and it's what we turn our attention to for the remainder of this talk. Researchers and faculty at executive education programs and other institutions are learning about the process of cognitive development and how that applies to leadership. The terms horizontal and vertical development are gaining popularity to describe qualitatively different kinds of growth experiences. Horizontal development is, teaches skills. It gives people the information and tools to do what they're doing with better outcomes and with more efficiency. Learning a process for how to do scenario planning, for instance. But learning how to think strategically is an example of vertical development. It's not about skills and about what you do. It's about how you think. These types of growth experiences are grounded in the, in the science of human development that shows how our minds can continue to grow over our lifetimes. The basic idea is that larger mindsets translate into the agility required to lead effectively in complex and ever-changing worlds. Developmental psychology, behavioral science, and neuroscience converge in this space. For leaders who need these adaptive capacities, abil abilities such as building coalitions, turning, uh, looking at issues from systemic strategic perspectives, responding to change with agility, the development programs themselves need to adapt to reflect those development needs. In practical terms, this means a shift from content-heavy training on competencies towards methods that accelerate the development of more complex ways of seeing. Our, mind, our, leads, our leaders need bigger, more complex minds in order to lead in bigger, more complex worlds. These types of de development approaches are emerging and exper experimental, much like the VUCA environments to which they attempt to respond. These approaches include team coaching, learning circles, high-risk classroom and on-the-job activities, giving speeches in front of large audiences. That was a joke. <laughs> Participant-led development, intensely focused executive education, mindfulness training, processes and programs that uncover and test assumptions and demand experimentation. They require a lot of reflection, a lot of dialogue, a lot of coaching, and a lot of discomfort in trying something new in public. For example, if we want to help our leaders learn to tolerate ambiguity with grace and without anxiety, we need to provide them ambiguous experiences so that they learn from that. One, of the poten one, of, one high potential leader that I had the opportunity to coach at Microsoft lobbied with his boss to take on the product development of a new t with a new team in India and leave the U.S. headquarters. In the U.S., he was much like this plant, fed, cultivated, but not allowed much room to grow. 
In India, he was forced to think creatively and to find resources and address the challenges that he faced without any direct supervision from his boss. What he was expected to do was to speak with his boss every few weeks and his coach about what he's learning about leadership, not about the technical problems that he was facing. What is he learning about doing business in India? When he came back to the US after a couple of years, he had transformed into somebody with a complex and comprehensive set of skills that inspired his company, his family, his team, his friends, his community in some brilliant kinds of ways. Approaches like these also take time. Time not only to participate in the learning experience itself, but time to digest, time to learn, time to try and understand what it was that you had just gone through. As Henry Mintzberg from the McGill School of Management says, leadership like swimming is not something that you can learn by reading about it. There's one image that frequently comes to mind on the Camino when I think about it even now three years later. It was mid-morning, a beautiful late summer day, and I was walking through a mountainous agricultural region, just a gorgeous part of the journey. I could see for a long way ahead of me on the path down a small valley and up a ridge, pilgrims strung all along the way like beads on a string. It was hot, the way was very steep, and it looked like people were moving very slowly with their heavy packs over this rocky path. In a breathtaking moment of clarity, I saw all of us joined together in our human struggle, each of us carrying a burden and a soul on a journey of enlightenment. Today, three years after my development experience, the Camino con continues to teach. Even preparing this talk helped me think more about what it was that I had learned about leadership on the Camino. As my com Camino friend Michael says, it takes a lot of learning from experiences to learn how to lead your life. Gracias. Thanks a lot.